Okay. All right, so call the meeting to order, and this meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. We are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. So if anyone else on the call is recording the meeting, please let me know so I may notify the other attendees. So is anyone else recording? Okay. Um, all right, so thank you. So the town is recording this. Um, so some housekeeping matters. Uh, Heather Johnson from the town is, host, is the host and will run the muting and unmuting. Um, the, as I understand it, the um, uh, sound quality is somewhat better if we're not all on uh, unmute at the same time. So if you're you know, interested in speaking at some point, I'll try to, I see the, you know, I see your persons, I can uh, try to uh, uh, accommodate that or else use the raise hand um, uh, icon on, the, um, uh, on Zoom. Um, all votes need to be by roll call. So that's, you know, uh, we have to go through everyone. Um, and I want to make sure I, hand, yes, I do have a list of the names handy. So um, we'll do minutes and whatever, that anything will be by roll call. Um, let's see. Yeah, so when, you know, if you raise your hand and have comments or questions, um, I recognize you, Heather will unmute you and, you know, we can have the discussion. Um, Tom and George are on the phone. I'll try to remember both of you, but I guess you can do the raise. Well, actually, you probably can't do the raise hand. Yeah, I will try to ask, remember to ask you if you have comments or questions. Um, and then for the members of the public, same thing. When it's time for public comment, please use the raise hand um, icon or otherwise try to wave or something. And um, Will. Victor, you muted yourself. I muted, yeah, well, Heather muted me there. <laughs> um, all right, so let's turn to the minutes. Um, and Heather, you muted yourself too. I went to mute everyone and didn't unmute Victor right away, so that was my fault, I apologize. So can I ask a question? Do we really have issues if people are on unmute? Because I'm on these calls all day long and we've never had an issue with people being off mute we can try it without i'm happy to it just if there's so many people I've, I've been on a few calls where people didn't realize how how strong the background noise was but i'm happy to victor said okay. to so i'm but i'm happy to try it without and if someone's if someone ends up not realizing that there's lots of background noise i can mute just them and then send them a private message within the app to let them know that I've muted them and to raise their hand if they, when they're ready to talk. That'd that might be easier for those that have called in as well and versus the, the video chat. All right, why don't we hit it that way? And we'll see okay. It. Sure. All right, so let's turn to minutes. Um, so March 3rd, uh, Julie, um, I guess unmute Julie, please, or you can unmute the, the committee. Um, Go ahead, any comments or issues? Okay, so um, thanks to Victor, Bob, um, for your help getting, uh, shaping up these minutes. And then I got, um, the only feedback I got for the March 3rd minutes was from Andy McElhaney, who had some suggested edits just for um, nothing substantive. It was just sort of um, suggestions on rewriting a couple of sentences. So I could go through those specifically or. Um, sure, why don't you point them out to the committee? Okay, so in the discussion of budget hearing education, paragraph two, sentence one, um, just sort of reframing that sentence so that it would read Historically, the average approved school budget increase has been 4.4% annually. If last year's school department budget were increased by 4.4%, 4 
that 4.4% would equal Dr. Austin's status quo budget. That's the first. Anyone have any questions about that? No. Okay, and then in the discussion of warrant article hearings and votes under section uh, article BBB. Sorry, just getting back to it. Um, paragraph two, last sentence to change that sentence to read, the planning board has studied these issues over the last year. Any questions about that? And then in the same section, um, changing paragraph three, sentences one and two to read, this change could impact landowners seeking to make covered changes by adding to their project costs the additional expense of a drainage engineering analysis. However, for some small projects, these additional expenses might be avoided or reduced by the planning board staff working with the landowner, by the planning board minimizing the extent of the necessary engineering analysis, or by the planning board granting a waiver. Any uh, questions about that? Any other comments on those minutes, questions? Has any, everyone had a chance to review them? Okay, can, may I have a motion then? I'll move to adopt the minutes of April, of March 3rd. Second. Right. We'll call vote. Bob Curley. Aye. Julie Straley. Aye. Tom Bellier. Aye. Aaron Kelly. Aye. Evan Sheehan. Aye. Libby Claypool. Aye. George Dennis. Aye. Andy McElhaney. Aye. Adrian Cooper. Aye. Dave Anderson. Aye. Nancy McDonald. Aye. Ed Gatos. Aye. Kathleen Amon. Aye. Eric Haskell. I abstain. Eric was absent from that meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess that was 14, uh, 13, 1301. Yeah. yeah, I've got that. Okay, thank you. So moving on to the um, March 5th meeting, uh, Andy McElhaney had a couple of suggestions for that um, set of minutes as well. And then also um, this meeting, um, Eric, Haskell asked, Eric Haskell came about halfway through the meeting that night. So I made a change to the minutes to, um, in two places to reflect that. First, I, uh, at the top of the minutes in attendance, when I list the committee members and town accountant Sue Nickerson, I thought I'd take Eric out of the body of that list and then just add on at the end that Eric Haskell joined the meeting halfway through. We didn't have any votes uh, during the first half of the meeting until <laughs> article, article N came along and that was the update to that article and Eric had missed the, um, the discussion that we had about the update, uh, reopening that article and just providing um, an updated uh, language. So at the end in the last sentence, um, the vote to approve the new recommendation was 13-01 with Eric Haskell abstaining and I added, because he had arrived after this discussion on the update to this article. Does anyone have any questions or suggestions about that? Okay, and other, the other comments? Okay, um, the other uh, were from Andy McElhaney and um, <clears throat> in um, the discussion of Article KK Climate Action Planning, Paragraph eight, sentence two, I was writing about how Chairman Baltera asked whether the town was considering 
uh, project grant money and I had written vulnerability and Andy suggested um, writing uh, the municipal vulnerability preparedness program. Does anyone have any questions about that? Appropriate. And um, he noted that I was I was a little inconsistent in that document about Chairman or Chair Balterra. And um, throughout the year, I've been referring to Victor as Chairman Balterra. So I just cleaned up those references in that um, document on March 5th. And um, next, in the discussion of budgets, um, Andy pointed out uh, that I was had some. Um, capitalization inconsistencies about fund balance. So again, I went through the document of the uh, minutes just to make sure that I had properly capital F for fund and B for balance. And then finally, um, in the dot list of documents distributed, um, the engineering firm Beals and Thomas, I had written Beals and, and A and D, but Beals and Thomas refers to itself as Beals and a plus sign and Thomas, which I had um, written in a different part of the minute. So just, just clean up stuff. Andy, Any questions? And, yeah, Andy needs a hobby. <laughs> no, they're all good. I mean, I appreciate it. It's Andy in quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm only going to call Victor Chairman Volterra from now on. <laughs> it's not so regal. I have a motion. I move the adoption of the minutes as amended uh, and recited and distributed by Julie. That is the minutes of March 5. Second. Okay. Um, again, roll call vote. Bob Curley. Aye. Julie Straley. Aye. Tom Bellier. Aye. Erin Kelly. Aye. Eric Haskell. Aye. Aye. Okay. George Dennis. Aye. Libby Claypool. Aye. Evan Sheehan. Aye. Andy McElhaney. Aye. Davaline Cooper. Aye. Dave Anderson. Aye. Nancy McDonald. Aye. Ed Gatos. Aye. Kathleen Amon. Aye. Aye. 14-0. And then finally, the minutes for March 10th. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry. Yeah, March 10th. I received suggestions from Andy McElhaney and also from Libby Claypool. And then I also have an edit to the uh, dollar amount for the budget passed, right, Victor? So, um so I'll go through just yeah, go through them. Yeah. Um, again, um, Andy had some good suggestions on cleanup of the um, uh, format of writing the year and annual count, annual town meeting. So I cleaned up a couple of references to uh, past year's annual town meeting to um, to be in line with the ADCOM guidelines for how to write the year and annual town meeting. In um, Article D, Report of Personnel Board, <clears throat> the uh, sentence in that, sorry, I need to pull this up. In the um, introduction paragraph for Article D, mm -hmm. Eric um, Haskell provided an overview of this article comment and a favorable recommendation. Um, I just cut off the end of the sentence, uh, the next sentence, to um, read, this article asks that the town appropriate $463,454 to meet the financial obligations relating to salary increases, fringe benefit changes, and job reclassifications for certain non-school department employees. Any questions about that? The, well, the original was accurate, wasn't it? Andy, do you want to go ahead and explain uh, I, the, your uh, the, thinking about that? 
<clears throat> the the original uh, added uh, employees who are either not yet in a collective bargaining unit. Uh, I didn't like that because it suggested we were encouraging or expecting further unionization. <clears throat> and uh, then it also added, uh, um, or uh, what, is it, what is it, uh, employees uh, uh, who are still in, uh, 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 whose who collective bargaining agreements have not yet been completed. And <clears throat> I wondered if you could do the math and figure out from that gross number and the uh, the uh, increases to the to the non-union employees how much the town was prepared to offer for the uh, union employees still in uh, negotiations, and I didn't think that either one of those were necessary or desirable. Well, Eric, um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's actually in the comment of the uh, of um, Article D, isn't it? Uh, I'd have to double check. I can pull it up if you like. I think that's where I got the language. That's where I do um, get a number of um, you know language for the minutes. I go to the comment to help explain the uh, article. I think that's language that's used each year. Um, I, I I have no objection to ending where Andy's suggesting, because that's also accurate. Um, but I, I think, you know, I, I think the part is, uh, the, the, the horse is out of the barn there, uh, Andy, I think. It, it, if it is, then my comments are, are moot. If it's, if it's not, then uh, I would suggest that we <clears throat> delete those last two uh, clauses. Yeah, that language is right out of the uh, comment. Okay. Okay, Julie, what, what else? I'm sorry, so are we gonna... I think, I think Andy said... With the language? Leave the... No, just, just that, leave it as it is. Okay. Forget my forget my change. Okay, and then his final suggestion again was just double checking um, capitalization of fund balance. So that's from Andy, and then I received from Libby um, an email that has a couple of edits for um, March tenth. Just trying to pull it back up. Sorry. Um, Okay, under Warren article vote O, repair reconstruction of the town pier. Um, Libby, the, in the first sentence, just a little bit of a change. Libby Claypool reported that this article was withdrawn over questions about whether the height of the seawall is sufficient given the significant increase in project cost. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay, and um, moving on to budget discussion and vote. In the second sentence, um, uh, the um, funds previously received from FEMA for 2015 winter storms. So she had changed that year. I got to go back. What did I put down there? Um, no, so she's adding the 2015 winter storm for the FEMA money. <clears throat> and then um, in the Following sentence, starting Libby Claypool reported that the Capital Outlay Committee convened today to discuss this additional funding. She suggests ending that with a period and, uh, no, putting in a comma and then deleting the part which says, which frees up the corresponding amount of capital which comes out of the levy, capital outlay, and then continuing the sentence and voted to add 11 projects. 
So I guess I could just reread the whole sentence if you want. You're just deleting the which frees up the corresponding amount of capital which comes out of the levy. And yes. Then capital outlay, making the rest of it one sentence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? Uh, and then under the public safety facility discussion, in paragraph three, when uh, Libby was discussing closer to the end of the paragraph that it makes sense to house the um, the quint at that location, she added the word new, new quint. And then she um, suggested adding in that same sentence after quint at that location because part of the cost for this apparatus was funded by shipyard development since they require a ladder truck sufficient to reach the top floors of the new buildings. And then she uh, deletes out the rest of that sentence and then adds at the end of the next sentence, Ms. Claypool also stressed the need for appointing a single person in charge of construction and oversight who can hold contractors accountable for the quality of work done. She adds, since issues have arisen at Central Fire Station because this was not done during its renovation. Can, can I ask a question? It seems like we're spending a ton of time on minutes this evening that we may not normally spend on minutes. Is it? Uh, that is, is right. It because you're, um, you're torturing well, us because we're on Zoom? So, that, well, in part, we're doing the roll call votes. We are spending more time um, because these are much lengthier minutes than in the past. And we're also waiting for um, selectmen meeting to be over. So we're giving them a little time so they can join us. Um, OK. But we're getting there. We're getting there, uh, Evan. Yeah. Okay. Victor, may I make a comment about <clears throat> what Julie just read? Uh, there are, number one, there are more than one quint in service. So the idea that this be the new quint ladder truck, um, that's, I think, what Libby meant. Uh, the second thing is that <clears throat> there has been a history of lack of oversight in town projects. And there are a number of them where someone was not in charge because either that was foregone or uh, an oversight or whatever, but there's a long history of that. And um, so these, some of these problems come back to haunt us later on. So uh, that, those are my comments. Great. Um, thank you, Julie. Anything else? Uh, so everyone's okay with those edits? Do you read them again? Well, we have, uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh my God, <laughs> <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Um, and, and uh, that's Heather, it from, that's it from Libby. Um, let's see. Uh, did I already go through Andy's suggestions? Yes. Did, yes. Okay. Um, and then finally, the. Um, I can't kick him. There is one last thing: is the dollar amount that we voted on the budget. So under, um, this is just new, new information or updated information. So under the section of uh, voting the budget, budget discussion and vote at the end, I have the uh, article six amount of 118.046.254 and um, Victor, um, and Sue were able to confer about double checking that amount. And even though it was kind of set up in Dave's spreadsheet, that number included some non Article 6 numbers. Right. So the Dave's spreadsheet included um, well, the, the, the 118 number that Julie's used there that's in the budget is actually the total um, uh, uses of the budget. So uh, or, or total, yeah, total uses. So that includes articles four and five. It also includes state assessments. It includes um, overlay amount um, and miscellaneous items. So we didn't vote 118. We voted article six, which the figure, if, um, well, the figure. I have that. 
Do you have it there? Yeah. Uh, 115 million eight hundred seventy nine thousand zero nine three. Any questions? Yes. Yes, Libby. Um, the total that I have from uh, what Sue sent me today would be 123,361,006. Well, 126, so. No, 123. That's, that's the water. That has the water yeah, company in it. Water. So and, the water. And the other two self-funded, Sue? Pardon me? Does it have the country club, the water system, and the sewer? Is it just the, the water system that needs to come out? Yeah, so Libby, if you look at the second sentence of Julie's minute where she's reading there, we had separated out the water company number. Okay. Right. So if you add the one, whatever, the 115 that Julie was just read, and you add the, the water company number, that gets you up to 126 ish or something like that. Okay. If I take the budget that Sue sent today for Article 6, which is the 123, back out the 10 million uh, 597 for the water, it should be. 112.7. I can give you the exact number, but that's, I'm just looking back at the minutes. So the 123, so, so Sue, maybe you better step in here. But what you sent out today and what I circulated to the committee is showing a grand total of 126,477,072. That includes yes. water? Yes, it does. Right. So I'm not sure. So Libby, the 123 that you're referring to, I, I'm not sure what number that is. It's, I'm taking Article 6, just mm -hmm. Article 6 from what ADCOM voted, which was 123-361-006, backing out the water, 10,597,979, and I get 112,763,000. Okay, you didn't add, add capital. If you're not taking 123, 360. Yeah, because yeah, article, capital. Capital. article 6 has capital in it, so you have to add that capital number. But so the chart doesn't show the, 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 the chart doesn't show, or I guess Dave's chart doesn't show the cap, it shows the capital separate as a separate number from, uh, from article 6 but it is part of article six. Yeah, so I'm just looking at that, where that is on the minutes, because I get one, one fifteen eight seventy nine. is that what you have? One fifteen eight seventy nine zero nine three. Okay, great, I'm all set. Okay, so I um, will make the change and um, that last paragraph First sentence, the committee recommended a total Article 6 budget of $115,879,093. Any other questions or comments? Anyway, I have you do, all right, go ahead. I, just, I was gonna say one nuance, Victor, though, is the way it's shown on um, the Article 6 in the warrant is, um, is does include the capital but the way it's shown on this forecast, it does break it out, but I guess it's still all considered Article 6, which does include capital, so I guess that's fine. Because on the warrant, it will be, it will include the capital. It would be in Article 6. That's okay. Right. It may have a motion. I'll move to adopt the uh, minutes as amended of March, what is it? 10. 10. Second, uh, Curly is trying to get everyone's yeah. attention. It, is the total of the 126 million being shown as well? Because water will be within Article 6. So the way it reads, Bob, is the committee recommended the total Article 6 budget of 115,879,093, period. This amount does not include the water budget amount of 10,597,979. Okay. All right, and then it goes on. Each of the municipal education, capital, and water budgets were moved for favorable action, reflecting previous advisory committee liaison recommendations as adjusted by the discussion. Okay. 
Is there any reason why the minutes need to separate that out? Because on the warrant, it will be in Article 6, as Bob I think, I think they're separated out. I, well, I won't speak for Julie, but we, because we voted separately. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of, I mean, I was writing the minutes um, from the point of view of that evening when we were going through Dave's spreadsheet and it's on the wall and how it kind of unfolded from there. I understand that that makes it confusing in a way, but we didn't have then and there the article six yeah completely put together so that's why i did it like that i mean you could put in a, par a parenthetical after that second sentence saying for a total article six budget and then give the complete number if people would prefer that i think, I think that's yeah so you'd like me to add that the um Total artist Article Six amount of the. Um, uh, so the committee recommended a drop the first total. The committee recommended a, an Article Six budget of the one fifteen. Yep. The amount does not include the water budget amount of ten five. For an for a total, Article Six budget or the, or this results in a total Article Six budget of one. 26 whatever the number is okay so i'd put that after the water um amount yes <clears throat> okay right. andy you want to repeat your motion um <clears throat> i move the adoption of the minutes prepared by uh, Ms. Fraley, as amended during this uh, discussion, the, i.e., the minutes of the March uh, second end meeting. Evans, more wine. Um, <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's not, there, Victor, there isn't enough wine in my house to get me through these minutes. <laughs> it, it, you know, uh, Evan, darkening the background to show the sun setting. Uh, faster than it actually is is not going to work. You know, it's my mood. We all have <laughs> we all have clocks, but I did want to add. <laughs> I, I I thought these minutes were remarkably well done. There's there's a lot of lots and lots of discussion and lots and lots of numbers, and uh, I found them remarkably uh, uh, accurate. Throughout the whole year. Yeah. Hats off to you, Julie. Thank you. Well, um, as always, thanks to Victor, Bob, and uh, we had Dave helping and Andy and Eric and Libby. So I always appreciate, um, I don't always sound like it, but I do appreciate everyone's <laughs> input. And um, those last three meetings, they were chock full of action. So they were doozies. Was, um, so we yeah. still need to vote. We have a second? Sorry. Sorry. Second. Yeah, we did. Bob Curley. Aye. Julie Straley. Aye. Tom Bellier. Aye. Eric Hi. Aye. Aaron Kelly. Aye. Evan Sheehan. Aye. Libby Claypool. Aye. George Dennis. Aye. Andy McElhaney. Aye. Davaline Cooper. Aye. Dave Anderson. Aye. Nancy McDonald. Aye. Ed Gatos. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Aye. I was muted. <laughs> Kathleen Allen. Hi. All right, thank you. So we got through that agenda item. Uh, <laughs> so that brings us to the financial end of things. And oh, the first boy. item on here is the forecast uh, update. So our budget vote was based on the town's revenue forecast of March 3rd. Um, got in just be just before the state shut down and the financial picture, of course, has changed significantly since then. I sent you an updated forecast um, with the agenda. So that was the forecast from April 27th, um, which incorporates new projections of decreases in revenue. Um, we can walk through that, but I'll point out first that um, at least some of the assumptions in there are already out of date. Uh, there are newer, newer projections of decreases reflected in the um, 
proposed financial plan that we'll get to later. Um, but we've not had a formal uh, forecast meeting since April 27th, so this is the this is the one we've been working with. Um, but let's walk through so the categories of the changes, recognizing that the numbers we can talk. When we talk about the financial plan, we can look more directly at the, the new numbers. Um, so if you can pull that up. Which document would you like us to pull up? This is the five-year forecast that, um, and I sent it out with the agendas last, what was it, Thursday? So the significant, cat well, the, the categories that are changing, um, there's uncollected tax revenue. So that affects the um, sources of, of revenue, of course. Um, and I won't go into the percentage now because we'll get to that. This one's reflecting 14.1% less, um, which is based on um, Massachusetts Taxpayer Foundation uh, analysis. Um, I'm sorry, that's not the, uh, that's, the uncollected tax revenue is based on experience in the prior downturn. The state aid decrease, which you'd see in this forecast, is upwards of $10 million. That's based on the Massachusetts Taxpayer Foundation um, analysis that was projecting at the time a 14.1 decrease in state revenue. Local receipts is another category that's down. Fund balance um, is actually new there, so we'll get to that. So this forecast is proposing um, filling the gap with fund balance. Go down further, there's excess overlay, so that's actually a plus because um, the assessors feel that they are comfortable releasing more overlay than they had previously um, said they were going to release. The, look at my notes here. Oh, also on this first page, note that um, this is showing unused levy capacity at zero, which is what the March 3rd um, analysis or forecast showed. Um, and we were using, you remember we were tapping into the unused levy capacity this year to be applied to the senior means tested tax relief that was adopted at town meeting last year. That has to be approved by the state legislature and it looks like um, it's very unlikely at this point in the year that um, the legislature will act on that. So that amount would come back into, um, uh, well, would come out, uh, uh, the levy, unused levy capacity would come back in. So we would have 500,000 there in sources of revenue, but it's a wash because it would come out of the uses. If you look down in the uses column, state assessments, the second one's overlay. So that overlay includes that $500,000. Am I getting that right, Sue? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm just not sure that we're doing that quite yet. That, I, I'm not sure if we're taking that off the table. Right, right. That's that's just one of the ideas. But that yep. five hundred thousand, the the unused levy capacity, yes, is open in terms of whether that's a way to fill um, fill the budget gap. You got it. Um, and just to let you know, Victor, Mary and Michelle have joined the meeting. Hello, Mary. Hello, Michelle. Thank you for joining us. Um, and then, if you look at the last page of the um, forecast, the 10 year history of local receipts. Uh, that's showing um, the specific line items in local receipts that we're expecting to be hit by, um, you know, the decrease in revenue. So motor vehicle excise, meals tax, um, charges for services, licenses, investment income, and then departmental um, payments. And again, we'll get into the specifics with the financial policy because those numbers are more, uh, are updated from this forecast. And did I skip one page? I think there were changes also on the page before that. 
yeah, that's more, right. Again, so this is showing more detail on um, the revenue projections at 21, again, as of 427. So it's breaking it down in terms of how the, the aspects of state aid that um, will be expected to be reduced as well as the, again, the local receipts and the uh, tax revenue. So if people have questions on the forecast, we can talk about that or we can talk again further about that as we get into the financial plan. Any questions at this point, comments? Uh, Victor, I just got a quick question. I noticed that there's a $58,500 from the Waterways Fund, which I did not see on my prior forecast. I'm just wondering if you could add flavor to that. Yes, what I did is I, I took it out of the fund balance line because it's for the Harbor Master, and now their mooring permits are going to the new Waterways account instead of going into the general fund. So we just split them out. Okay. It's Harbor, Harbor Master's capital. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. It's it's basically mooring fees. And Sue, just to confirm, because I had that Warren article, this we'll see this from now on. This is how yes. it's going to be handled. Yep. So everyone knows you'll see that now on all the forecasts. Okay. Um, let's move to then the next item on the agenda: budgets. And the first piece is. Um, fiscal 20 update. So the revenue issues hit us mid-March when everything started to shut down. Um, the financial plan on page two lists expected deficits in fiscal 20. And again, you, I think you've had this plan. Well, you only had this plan since last night. So um, you haven't really had that much time to digest it. Um, but this is showing $125,005 expected deficit based on the um, anticipated revenue reductions. Um, now that Michelle's here, um, we can run through that. But the bottom line is that Tom Ameo is com comfortable that with um, sort of expense controls that he's instituted and also just general turnbacks that we would expect. Uh, that that will be covered. So that really, they're not, and the town is not anticipating any issue for the um, fiscal 20 to uh, close out this year. Um, so Michelle, is there anything further you want to add on that? Um, or right, wh why don't I ask, since the committee's only had this um, plan for a relatively short period of time, if you, if you could walk us through, um, you know, the fiscal 20 um, reductions and uh, how you'd meet that. Sure. So let me just pull that up. Can everyone hear me okay? We okay, hear you thank you. Perfectly, Michelle. Let me just find that. So our fiscal 20, um, their projected revenue deficit here, some of it has come from Jean Montgomery and Sue Nickerson looking at the revenue that we've collected to date. On the meals tax revenue, the first item, the 129, 129,000, that represents the difference between what we had budgeted for FY20 and what we would need to bring in in the fourth quarter to meet that number. Um, so we're being very conservative here and saying that we'll get no revenue whatsoever in quarter four. Um, as you all know, takeout and delivery options continue. So we're just, um, we'll have a better sense after this quarter of what that revenue looks like, but it won't be exactly zero because there are still some res restaurant operations taking place right now. Um, the next two numbers really come from Jean Montgomery. This is because, so this is the 21,800 reduction in penalties and interest and the $12,000 reduction in investment income. Um, she's project, projecting that we will be short this money because the Board of Selectmen voted to extend the property tax deadline um, to June 1st from May 1st. And so we would have earned um, the investment income on the taxes we would have collected earlier. And <coughs> We likely would have collected some penalties and interest um, if people were late, you know, before in May versus in June, if that makes sense. The last number, the 212,492, this comes from Kevin Whalen from the South Shore Country Club. 
he was looking at his expenditures and revenue and we asked him to be conservative. Well, at the time it seemed realistic, right? That the club would not open until June 1st at a minimum. We know that they opened this past Saturday. Right now it's the permit holders only. So hopefully once we're able to open more broadly to the public, hopefully this number will go down slightly. And then, um, and by the way, Kevin was doing really well at the country club this year. And then of course a global pandemic hit and he wasn't able to open. So he, a lot of the changes that he's put in place in the financial management practices he's done there by taking a hard look at his revenue and expenses over the last year had really started to pay off and he was projecting to close the year very well. Um, so hopefully we'll be in that, <laughs> hopefully he'll have better luck next year. Um, in terms of the FY20 other revenue sources, this increase in new growth was, growth was above what we had forecasted um, as of this time last year. So that new growth has come in. And then this $30,000 in federal stimulus um, has also come in for related to ambulances, but it is not tied to specific expenses. So it's, um, it's not gonna net out the way that we, um, we've gotten some money from the Department of Public Health here in the state that can be used for surge staffing for our health department. And that is netting itself out because it's being applied directly to some expenditures and therefore we won't be able to take advantage of that revenue um, to close this deficit in the same way, if that makes sense. So overall, we're projecting to close the year about $125,000 short in revenue. But um, as Sue probably mentioned, Tom directed our departments um, back in March and then have reinforced that message since that we really need to tighten up on spending and we're projecting that we'll be able to more than cover that um, through interdepartmental transfers and turnbacks at the end of this year. Um, Sue might have mentioned that snow and ice in particular, we had a very light year. So there's about $172,000 left in that item alone. And then um, there's quite a bit of funds left in engineering, for example, because we had um, not many staff there for this year and the work, the project slowed down a bit. And we're, we've just rehired a town engineer a few months ago or are still in the process of staffing up. So we'll see some savings there too. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Any questions for Michelle on fiscal 20? Other uh, yes, Libby. Um, I know one thing I, I was curious about, and, and I thought it was going to be announced at the last Selectman meeting or last Thursday night was, I guess, to Sue or Michelle, do you have any idea at this point with everything, um, the turn backs, what they will be for fiscal 20? Do you have I idea? don't. I, I don't have an exact amount. Um, there, there will be some savings in group insurance, snow and ice, uh, engineering, um, but also I don't know what the reserve fund transfers are going to be like. We have legal. Um, I know my unemployment. Unemployment. It, I don't even know what that that's going to be. They're so far behind. I am not even going to get a March bill until June. So there are still some departments that will need reserve fund transfers. So I, I, we will have um, substantial savings. I just don't know how much quite yet. Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay. Um, fiscal 21. So again, I'll, I'll let Michelle run through this, but before, let me just, preface it by a couple of comments. So the, the bottom line that you'll see when Michelle runs through the numbers is a projected deficit of 3,334,737, so a bit more than $3 million. Um, where, you know, we have to have a balanced budget, so we have a few options to fill the gap. Um, one is to reopen the budget and cut some budgets. One, um, which is being proposed in the financial policy, is to use fund balance, um, the rainy day fund after all. Um, I suppose we could borrow, although I don't know that we want to borrow for operating expenses. Uh, as Sue mentioned earlier, part of this, although certainly not the whole three million, um, could be met by excess overlay. Um, so, you know, part of the problem here, I think a, a big part of the problem is the uncertainty of whether there's going to be further revenue 
drops. I mean, we're really making guesses, educated guesses, but um, they're guesses. Um, and therefore, that suggests the need to go slow and have controls in place, at least to delay spending until after the first quarter, perhaps, when we may have a better picture of revenue. Um, we would hope to. Um, so whatever approach we took, you know, we want to make sure we're able to not overspend and be able to adjust to further downturns. Uh, on the other hand, if we cut right now, um, we're confronted with the idea of what if we didn't need to. And so uh, again, I think a big part of our problem is um, the uncertainty in terms of what the revenue picture is really going to be. Um, but with that introduction, Michelle, if I can ask you to sort of run through your analysis of projected deficits and then you know, we can discuss any questions and comments the committee has and from there move on to what um, what the finance team is proposing and I guess at this point the selectmen have um, adopted this um, financial plan so what the um, you know Mary you can chime in as well in terms of um, explaining to the committee um, the reasoning and behind the plan and how it would work but M Michelle if you could run us through the projected deficits, uh, please. Sure, thank you. Um, so for FY21, the first number that we've adjusted here for $805,708 is a reduction in property tax collections. Um, this is, represents a 0.9% reduction, which is the average of what we saw in FY09 and FY10, you know, compared to the previous year. Um, like Victor said, we're trying to make our best educated guesses here. The Great Recession is sort of the closest or the most recent close-ish economic event um, that we can use to try to guess how um, people might be affected. But um, so that's a, that's a reduction we've made there. Um, the biggest reduction you see here is in state aid. The latest numbers that we've been hearing from the Mass Municipal Association and the Mass Taxpayers Foundation indicated about a 19.2% reduction. Um, they talked about, uh, this corresponds to a, a $6, six billion, right, Sue? Um, reduction in, in state tax collection. So this represents $1.9 million. It does not include the MSBA money that we're getting for Hingham High School, because we've heard that um, MSBA, that money and future MSBA money will not be affected. Um, foster school? No, no. This is, um, this is the last. This is the last MSBA oh, payment right. for the yeah. old high school. Okay. Yeah. And I believe it helps us offset our debt payments. Yes. Related to that project. Um, so that's how we've we've adjusted that number right there. For motor vehicle excise tax, we held this constant from FY20. We actually wanted to hold it constant from FY19, kind of under the assumption that maybe people won't be purchasing new vehicles. Um, but the FY19 collections were actually higher than both the 20 and 21 projections. So we held a constant for 20. That represents about a $50,000 decrease. And talking to Jean Montgomery, she's very comfortable with that number. In meals tax, again, we did sort of what we did for the last quarter of, of FY20. For the first quarter of FY21, we're assuming absolutely zero revenue there. And again, um, there will likely still be takeout and delivery operations, and then maybe restaurants will start to open to um, some of the proposals you're probably hearing about, about limit, limited capacity, maybe outdoor seating, et cetera. So hopefully those receipts, they'll definitely be more than zero, but we thought it best to be conservative. Um, the reduction in charges and services and the reduction, the reduction in licenses and permits, permits and the reduction in departmental revenue, we applied the same 19.2% reduction as in state aid, because we thought that was the best representation of how sort of the economic activity would be affected. Um, we didn't have, this was also more conservative than what we were seeing when we looked back at FY09 and FY10 and thought it best to be, um, to be more conservative in all three of these areas. So I think the last one 
is investment income. This was, we had been projecting this to be $600,000 this year, but the interest rates have dropped considerably. Um, we looked back at FY09 and FY10, but our, our balance of cash in the bank earning this interest is much higher. So this is the number we landed on with Gene and Sue for a conservative estimate there. If I go down, um, you'll see that there is a source of, another source of revenue we've identified um, for FY21, and that's an additional $200,000. It could be as high as $250,000 um, from the excess, release from the excess overlay account. We expect that to happen in the next few weeks because we are um, close to reaching a settlement agreement with Linden Ponds with their abatement case, and it looks like uh, we will be able to comfortably release um, that money from that account and put it towards the FY21 budget. The Board of Assessors would need to take this vote, but like I said, we expect that to be finalized in the next few weeks and feel confident counting that towards our FY21 number. The $3.3 million number that Victor pointed out, just one note is that's, that's the amount of fund balance that we're proposing um, we use to fill these COVID-related revenue deficits. There's also $284,000 that we've talked about previously um, in the fund balance line in the new forecast um, whenever we formally finalize that because that's the FEMA reimbursement we got from the 2015 winter storms. As you may recall that we were planning to use for some targeted school CPW um, and town hall capital. So the true request from fund balance is the 3.3 plus the 284.5 um, at this time. And there's also, um, bear in mind, some Warren articles that would be looking for money from fund balance. Correct. So if those, if those are um, approved, then that would also, there are three of them, I believe, that would come from fund balance. Questions, comments? I'm sorry, Michelle, that number was 283 what? 284,500 for the capital um, using the FEMA reimbursement money. And Mary and Sue, please feel to feel free to jump in and correct me if I get anything wrong. Just, just a reminder that we're getting a, a substantial um, added amount to fund balance when the water company closes because of all of those costs. It's about 1.7 million, as I recall. That's right. Victor, I've got a couple of questions. Yes, Libby. Mm -hmm. Um, and just for um, this kind of ties into it's just a comment that on I think it was Ed's question about the waterways fund is um, <clears throat> which um, the way Michelle just explained that with the FEMA money um, cleared up something for me because a previous forecast showed 343,000 um, before this extra COVID um, budget money is um, needed and what that is is the 284.5 for the FEMA money and then the 58.5 for the waterways. And that's the 343, which previously I was like, what is that 343 again? So um, for anybody else that was wondering. Um, and two other things. Um, one is, I don't know if it's, I mean, this may be picking fly specs out of the pepper, but when I was trying to reconcile these numbers, it was 19.23% that you used. So just for the purposes of this, you know, this document, this is being memorialized. If, if anyone was ever trying to get to those numbers, I mean, that's the reduction that you used. And I guess I'm curious, I know you said that it was the, um, the um, I'm looking at the, um, you know, previously you were using the, the from the MMA and um, the MTF 14.1. So now how did you get to the 19.23 from 14.1? changed their uh, analysis, I believe. Yes, they, they went from $4.4 .4 billion reduction in, in tax revenue for the state to uh, almost $6 billion. Okay, okay, thanks. So it went from 14.1 up to 19.23. Okay, great. And then I guess my final question, I think you just touched on it, Victor, was just the idea that I think there's about nine Warren articles that are being funded from, there's a couple from CPC, um, and then obviously there's some from borrowing fund balance. And I wondered if given the different moving parts we have now in fund balance, if there's, if that's something that's going to be discussed or if any consideration is being given to reconsidering any of those warrant articles. Well, CPC comes from CPC money, not fund balance. 
yeah, I was more concerned with the borrowing and the fund balance. But then again, you know, if property taxes are down, CPC funds will be down. So I just didn't know to whatever extent any, if any of those nine articles were going to be reconsidered or if they're all, if from the um, town, you know, administrator standpoint and the selectmen, if they see any of those that should be reconsidered. And I guess the one that jumps out at me is the uh, article CC, the maintenance facility for the country club, because that, that debt was gonna be repaid to the town from their operating revenues. And, um, you know, obviously we're seeing a potential deficit for fiscal 20. And I wondered if, um, if that's also something that should be considered in the fiscal 21 shortfalls is um, the country club revenue and whether we think that they're gonna have sufficient user rates and fees to pay the debt service back to the town for that $2.2 million facility. So these items, so my understanding is there's no proposal to open up any of those articles, but that's certainly something that's open for discussion if that's something we wanna recommend. Um, but again, I'll let Mary um, Michelle speak to this. My understanding is that currently the selectmen are comfortable with those, um, uh, the amounts that would be coming from those uh, Warren articles, whether they're borrowing or from fund balance. Now, whether they would propose going ahead right away with borrowing, I, I don't know. You know, the rates are low. But Mary, I don't know if you want to ad address that. Um, uh, Victor, I think you've uh, addressed it and, you know, the board has not, uh, Karen, Joe and I have not discussed those Warren articles uh, at all in a, you know, in a public meeting. So um, I, I think our plan at this time is to move ahead. Um, I would also just say that with respect to the country club, I know that the country club management committee is, um, is monitoring their situation very closely. And um, uh, I know that they met yesterday. And at this time, uh, they have not taken any sort of a different position. Um, but they are continuing to keep an eye on it. Okay. Other if, if I could just say something about the CPC articles, Libby. <clears throat> yep. Any revenue we get in 21 is not for any of these articles. Anything we get in 21 would be anything going forward. Yep, good point. Yeah, because this is from their, their what's in their fund balance. Yeah. I definitely think we have to keep our, our eyes and ears open on the country club because if we're already potentially going to have run a deficit in 20, we don't know what's going to happen in 21. And given that, you know, there is that possibility of, the 2.2 million worth of debt being floated. We really want to make sure, and I guess I'm, I'm channeling Tom Bellier here about- um, Right, about, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. What about, about the pool? We don't want the town to be, um, you know, providing for that enterprise fund, providing, you know, getting too used to providing that backstop when that wasn't the original intent. And I'm a user of the country club and I love it, but I'm just looking, I have my financial hat on now, not my golf hat. Well, I do, but. <laughs> uh, on the subject of the country club before we leave it my daughter-in-law's email group wanted to thank the country club for opening on the day before mother's day okay um and victor yes dave um I, I had a question on the country club too and it's kind of in the context of this overall plan, which is that, uh, and I, I share Libby's enthusiasm for the place, but I'm just imagining in a worst case scenario where somehow golf, you know, gets restricted again or something like that, the fall season gets cut short. I should know this, but I don't, but can someone remind me, is it conceivable that the country clubs running in the red or a deficit would trigger tier two? In other words, or is this set up in such a way that it really you know, a lot of bad facts working against the country club through no fault of their own and we find ourselves in tier two? Or is there a mechanism, or should we contemplate a mechanism to potentially try to separate that from the, the impact that would have on the municipal and school budgets as well? 
let's hold that question until I uh, will make sure everyone's set with the, the deficit um, analysis here and then give Michelle a chance to walk us through the financial plan, but that's a very good question. I think we'll come back to that. Other questions on the, um, the, the revenue deficit analysis? Okay. All right. So, Michelle, can you, or, or Mary, one of you, walk us through the financial plan? And um, I, I think you do describe it in here, but sort of how it came about and what the goal is, what the, what the hope is to, to accomplish. Do you want me to go, Mary, or do you want to go? Michelle, why don't, why don't you walk through? Sure. Um, so, Victor, I think the overall goal is to, is to try to put these practices in place, these financial controls in place, to ensure that we can manage to a balanced FY21 budget. Um, I think we've outlined a goal in here that talks about doing that while minimizing disruption to public services that we provide on the municipal and school sides. Um, mm -hmm while not over relying too much on our fund balance, making sure that we're using that responsibly. I think we've noted in here that um, we've got a balance of more than $30 million in unassigned fund balance, about 7.5 million of which is above the maximum end of our financial policy of keeping 20% of um, total annual expenditures in there. So Tom's been referring to this a lot as our rainy day fund and you know says, look outside, it's pouring. Um, but that can't be our only solution to filling any projected gaps. Um, the other piece of it is making sure that we're accounting for the COVID related expenses that the town's incurring in here. So we think that this pre presents a balanced approach um, in terms of using available reserves and then putting this financial control framework in place and making sure that um, the Board of Selectmen, the school committee and the advisory committee hopefully are all on board with this approach. So. We're proposing to start the year off in a more conservative stance. Um, we're asking that town meeting fully fund the FY21 budget that this committee approved um, back in March before this all hit, and that we manage conservatively hold back on spending. I think, like Victor said, right, don't hire, um, hire make only essential hires, start only essential capital projects, especially in the first quarter, um, to make sure that we're to see how all of the revenue projections um, actually play out in FY21. What we've put in place here is a two-tiered approach um, with the advisory committee having oversight of this and with different um, financial controls triggered by the different tiers. The threshold amount we have is $500,000. So once the projected budget deficit, if it reaches over $500,000, and that assumes using the full 3.3 .3 million of fund balance. This is not before we use that. That's, when you think of FY21, just assume that is part of the plan. So if the picture worsens and we're in a case where say we're projecting an $800,000 budget deficit, um, that would trigger tier two and we would take additional operating and capital budget um, actions to make sure that we are managing to fill that gap. Um, the way we have just, divided up the responsibility for filling that projected deficit is 40% um, would be on the municipal side and 60% would be on the school side. Um, the documents that we're proposing we use to track this is a, an FY21 financial analysis spreadsheet, which also has a budget scorecard in there. And you may have noticed that we've, we've populated some of the FY21 projections in there just with fake numbers to kind of see how the spreadsheet might work. Um, that's set up for July 31st, so we don't have all of the real data right now to plug in there. Um, and we've set up the budget scorecard to kind of quickly see, here's what we are projecting in terms of revenue holes, in terms of meals tax, motor vehicle exercise, excise, et cetera. And here's where those numbers are actually coming in. But we can't track just those revenues. We have to track all revenues, all expenditures to see where we are. Those full year FY21 projections would be would be done each month with the forecast group, which as you know, has uh, representatives from the Selectman's office, the school committee and advisory, and then works with the finance teams like Sue and John Ferris. So we, to make those full year FY21 projections when we're in next year, um, we're gonna do that relying on the judgment and expertise of our department heads, right? So 
Dean Montgomery is going to be able to help us figure out what property tax collections should look like for the full year. Randy's going to be able to talk to us about what he's expecting for DPW expenditures for the rest of the year. Same with John Ferris and school operations. So that's, we'll look at the revenue that's come in and the expenditures that have happened so far. We will talk about all of the COVID-19 related expenditures and the forecast group will be reviewing which ones we believe are, are reimbursable. Anything that's reimbursable, we are not going to count as towards, towards a projected deficit because even if that reimbursement comes in in future years, um, we see that as, as you know, replenishing fund balance or being paid for. Um, so that's how we're proposing to do this on a monthly basis with then some quarterly reports um, more formally to the Board of Selectmen, the School Committee, and the Advisory Committee. Um, while we've set this threshold at 500,000 between Tiers 1 and Tier 2, um, we've kind of left it up more to the discretion of the forecast group, but also the, mostly the Advisory Committee to decide if, if things look if things are actually doing very well in FY21, it'll be a discussion about at what point do we actually come out of tier one and go back to just normal operations. If things look really, really bad in FY21 and everything just falls apart, um, we're going to have to make some deep cut, cuts and painful contractions, but there may come a point, and we don't want to set a dollar amount on that right now, that we have to come together and figure out what action should we take? You know, is a special town meeting triggered or is there some other course of action we might take? Um, but those are, the, those are the general parameters of what we're talking about. The different management actions that either the school or the municipal departments might take would be up to the discretion of Dr. Austin and, and Tom to be able to choose between um, personnel in terms of new hires, hiring freezes, force reduction measures like furloughs or layoffs, um, to look at the capital projects, to look at other operating expenditures. Um, what we're asking both sides here to be responsible for is, is um, coming up with that 40 or 60 percent of the gap, and it's up to both sides to decide how to best make that work given their operations. Um, one thing that we, we made a quick note in here, and it confused a lot of people before, this plan is completely tied to revenue projections. So if the money's not there, we have to reduce spending. Um, we, we made a little caveat here that says, um, if services look different, for example, if we can't, if town facilities have to close again in FY21, or if we can't reopen certain things fully to the public, we may make separate decisions to reduce operations there or reduce staff to reflect the lower level of services provided, but we're not, um, just wanted to make that caveat. Um, Mary, do you want to add anything? I feel like I'm jumping around here. Um, thank you. And, uh, you know, before I start, and um, just on, on behalf of Karen, Joe, and I, we just want to also um, acknowledge that Michelle and Sue, along with Tom Mayo, have just put a significant amount of effort into putting this plan together uh, for your consideration tonight. And um, once again, uh, Michelle, Sue, and Tom are really going above and beyond. And we are just so fortunate in this town to have such dedicated volunteers. Um, I'm just going to speak to a couple of the policy pieces that informed the board's decision on the plan. Uh, just some specifics about fund balance. As you can see in the memo, um, as of June 30th of 2019, our excess fund balance was about $7.6 million above the upper limit of our financial policy. Um, you know, we had been talking a few months ago about potentially uh, using those proceeds to defray some of the capital projects under consideration. Uh, but essentially what, um, in, in looking at fund balance to um, offset the current revenue shortfall we have, we would be using a little less than half of that right away. Um, we have spoken to capital market advisors to get a sense from them of how the rating agencies might view our using our fund balance, whether there would be any level of fund balance spending that would trigger a concern on their part. And what they've essentially uh, said to us is that um, uh, what we are proposing is, um, is, is appropriate. And what, what they also said was that um, in addition to withdrawing from fund balance, having this financial plan where 
we might also look at uh, reducing costs should should things worsen. Oh, uh, they felt yeah. that all things being equal, that that the rating agencies uh, would view that in a very favorable light. Um, I also participated in a Mass Municipal Association call on Friday, and the Mass Municipal Association is actually um, really urging the bond rating agencies to um, hold Massachusetts communities harmless for using fund balance under these circumstances. Um, as Michelle said that, you know, this is our rainy day fund and uh, this is an appropriate use. With respect to the degree to which the board looked at how much do we want to tap into fund balance, um, there were a couple things that, that also affected that decision. Um, first of all, uh, again, according to, um, you know, the Mass Taxpayers Foundation in the middle of April put out an estimate of Massachusetts revenue. Two weeks later, this past Friday, they said, you know, we think it's going to be worse. Um, at a Mass Municipal Association presentation on Friday, there were references to the impact of COVID-19 at a state level extending beyond fiscal year 21. Um, and there was a statement by Jeff Beckworth that without, without federal assistance, the impact of COVID-19 on the state and on, on municipalities is going to be significant. So, you know, we're also thinking about if, if this does extend, we want to make sure that we have fund balance resources to potentially apply in FY22 should that be necessary. Um, we also, uh, through some great work done by Jean Montgomery, what we saw in the financial crisis in, in 2008 was that the impact in Hingham revenue was most significant about 12 to 18 months after the event itself. Um, we saw a, a more significant drop off in property tax collection rates at like the 12 to 18 month mark, which when you think about it, if you think about kind of Hingham demographics, you think about um, the types of professions people are in, if, if, if our citizens may lose their jobs, some of them may have, um, you know, their own personal rainy day funds to rely on. They may also have severance packages from employees. So we have to be prepared for the impact on Hingham to potentially be, you know, more significant than it is, say, at the end of this first quarter. So, uh, and then the last thing that drove our, our decision about fund balance, as Michelle alluded to, is um, is is the costs associated with COVID-19. Um, you know, to date, I think we've had about, I think it's maybe, Sue, about $35,000 in kind of direct COVID expenses. But where we envision the potential for really significant expenses is in reopening government in our schools in a post-COVID-19 world. Um, the example I would give you is, you know, if you ever see a school bus uh, around Hingham, on a school day, you know, you see that that it's packed with kids. You've got three kids in a seat. You know, those of you who have kids, they've probably complained about how crowded the buses are. As we think about transporting 4,500 children to school every day, you know, we may be faced with a situation where um, we have to go out and lease more buses because we can only have one child in a seat. Um, I think about firefighters who have to, um, you know, sleep, you know, they, when they're on duty for 72 hours, um, you know, they are sleeping at the fire station. We have uh, sleeping accommodations, as some of you know, where um, that are, people are in very close quarters. So we, what still is a big unknown is what sort of costs the town will incur in terms of resuming operations in a post COVID-19 world. While there's discussion about the CARES Act, um, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, if you have them because I'm the Plymouth County Advisory Board representative for the town. Um, you know, $91 million to Plymouth County sounds like a lot of money right now, but I think there are gonna be a lot of demands on that money. So we can't count on all of our ex COVID related expenses being reimbursed. Uh, another reason to be considerate about how aggressively we lean into fund balance. Um, I'd say one last thing, and, and I know that this is something that we've talked about with the school committee and Dr. Austin. It's, it's the, 
the board and the school committee's collective intent that we would begin the year really trying to um, trying to spend very judiciously. So uh, while there may be budgeted positions that are funded, uh, you know, the direction that we've given Tom and I know the school committee's given Dr. Austin is, um, you know, let's be very judicious. Let's not, if, if we can wait on filling a position, let's wait. If we can defer capital spending um, until we get a better handle on the revenue, let's do that. So um, what we're actually in the process of doing is identifying what can be deferred so that if we find ourselves in a situation where we have to reduce costs or in tier two, um, we, you know, we have some options available to us. Um, I just close with one, one last piece, which is, um, you know, we're going to continue to monitor the state revenue collection and look at that Mass Taxpayers Foundation metric. But we need to keep in mind that about 75% of our revenue comes from property taxes. And the first really good look we're going to get our, in our revenue is after the first quarter of the new fiscal year, which is going to be in like early October. So, you know, as, as we're looking at that, we're saying let's, let's moderate spending until then. Um, but that, that's going to be really an important time for us to assess how we're doing against these projections. Given that property taxes represent such a big piece of our revenue pie, um, that's going to be a really important look at how we're doing. Um, in some ways, we wish it was a little earlier, but, um, you know, that's, that's the timing of the collections. So, thank you. So, so Mary, just on that point, so the, so the property tax bill is due, is it August 1? So the property tax bill will be due on um, September 30th, right, Sue? June, July, I thought we do we pay May one August? You're you're on mute, mute Sue. Sorry, um, May it's May one, August one, November one. Yep. Okay, so we may know mid September or something like that. We may, yeah, we may know mid September. Yep. Okay. And then the other piece out there, of course, is when the state decides to come up with its budget, which hopefully will be not too delayed, but presumably yeah. maybe, maybe mid-summer, right? Mid or late summer. Well, um, at the, uh, during the MMA presentation on Friday, and, and Victor, I'm happy to forward you a copy of the presentation deck. Um, at, at this point, the state is not, uh, the state has basically said that, um, I, I, don't, I don't remember the exact terminology, but they're not, they're not looking at the budget right now because of the uncertainty. And um, so they, they were not able to give us an estimated timing on when we might get that. I do understand that Mass Taxpayers Foundation is gonna come out with a, um, some sort of a report and a more formal assessment of revenue in the next week or two. But um, we haven't been given an ETA on a, on a state budget. Okay. They have the same uncertainty problems we do. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for both of you for the um, the overview there mm -hmm. and the information. I'll throw it open to the committee. And why don't we actually start with Dave's question? So, Dave, do you want to repeat your, your question about the country club? Sure. Could I actually just jump in front of it, though, with another question that I had, which is the – so just to make sure I get this right, tier one – Today, if we did nothing, we've approved the budget, the expenditures we've approved would stay. And what we're looking at is filling a three and a half million dollar hole, give or take with fund balance. So moving into tier one, what's going to happen, as I understand it, is that all we won't move on non-essential capital, non-essential hires. But I get it sounds like, Mary, from what you just said, and as I read the memo a couple of times, is the have the determinations been made about what's essential and what isn't essential? And is there any sense at this early point in time as to the order of magnitude of the additional savings above the approved budget amounts from tier one, if that makes sense? So um, both Dr. Austin and Tom are actually working on identifying the essential and non-essential aspects of 
personnel expenses and capital. And, and I think Victor had asked that perhaps they try to have those prepared for, for you folks for this Thursday. Um, I can tell you that from, from our board's perspective, the direction we've given Tom is that, um, you know, it's like proof, prove to us that it's essential because we're assuming right now, let's, let's defer as much of as many of those things as we possibly can. We would expect that the essential items would be in the minority. Uh, so another way to ask it would be, and I should also know this having looked at all the budgets, but ballpark in terms of just budgeted new hires, if we hired nobody, do we know what the overall um, savings would be? Nobody that's, no one that's budgeted or funded, I guess, is the question. So on the school side, uh, Dr. Austin mentioned yesterday that the FY21 school budget uh, does not have any new hires. However, there are some FY20 budgeted open positions, okay. uh, which I believe, I believe he's reflecting. Uh, on the town side, I think we have a couple open positions from 20 and for 21, I think it's a couple. M Michelle, I, I don't know if you uh, have the details on that. Um, Dave, we started to put the numbers together, but off the top of my head on the municipal side, it would be the DPW assistant superintendent, a DPW admin, um, the GIS coordinator, the um, procurement and contracts manager, and the part-time town hall custodian. But then we know there's a couple other things coming up, like our assessor, Rick Nallen's retiring at the end of June. Um, that's likely, that's a position we're going to need to fill, but there'll be some savings, right? Because he's at a step six and the person who replaces him will likely not come in at the highest step. So we will be able to capture all of those um, savings and changes in the, in the tier action plan template that we put together. Um, but I also think your question, it's a matter of timing too. With something like a, a position to hire, every month we don't hire them, those savings are real. Every month we defer a capital project, those savings aren't real unless we defer capital past FY21. So I think um, we're looking at these in different ways. The, the tier one approach is both about the timing, meaning coming starting the fiscal year and quarter one in this conservative stance, but it's also about that $500,000 threshold, which um, like Mary said, we likely won't know, we'll get the first real look of where we're doing um, after the first quarter. So should say a $200,000 budget deficit appear at that time, we're gonna to have to take some additional steps within tier one to make sure we generate those savings. Okay, that's helpful. I thank you very much for that. And so then just to return to the country club question, that question was basically just, is there, as it's, or what, what's the thinking behind the country club in particular? And if, if some horrible things befell it from a weather standpoint or a COVID standpoint, and it ended up running a deficit, would that deficit flow through to potentially trigger tier one, or is there any way for us to kind of isolate it as an <coughs> and, and, and save the, I, I mean, I don't mean to save the rest of the budget, but I, I, hopefully the point's getting across. Dave, um, actually, uh, one of the benefits of being on a Zoom call is that you can multitask. And <laughs> I texted Christine Smith, who's the chair of the country club committee, when the question came up earlier, and um, uh, what, you know, what, what she's telling me is that um, this was discussed at their meeting yesterday and that the country club committee is not comfortable, you know, they don't want to go ahead with, um, you know, full steam on the project unless they're comfortable that the revenue and the debt service can support it. So they are looking at, um, you know, they are looking at potentially um, only spending some of the money in the first year and perhaps just kind of slow rolling it. But it's, it's their intent that um, they would not move ahead unless they were comfortable with their revenue picture. And is there any, is there any risk, uh, leaving aside the capital project, I, I get Libby's question, that's a good one, but is there any risk on the operating side that they would swap red ink that would be um, impactful to this? Again, I'm just thinking about uh, things that aren't in their control. Golf gets shut down again, what, you know, restaurants only take out, all those kind of things. I think, um, so at the end of the day, their numbers are included in our revenue and expense analysis to the extent that they find themselves in a deficit because of COVID-related expenses. 
as long as those expenses were reimbursable, they wouldn't count towards the deficit. Um, I will say that Kevin Whelan, like you're saying, right, if the, if the club is closed and the revenue is not coming in, they will cut expenses um, as much as they can. So he works really hard with the country club management committee to manage to um, whatever resources are coming in and what's available. We, right now we're projecting that he can run his full operation in FY21 and we're already gradually moving back there, but um, he will adjust his expenses to, to meet the revenue that's available. I, I would just add that, um, again, information from Christine that um, since Friday, the country club has collected over $40,000 in, um, in permits and in memberships. So um, I, I think they, they are continuing, as Michelle said, to look at, to look at um, what sort of expenses their revenues can support and, and adjust accordingly. So I guess, let me just, and then I'll be done. I'm sorry to monopolize this. I'm just, I'm just wondering if the fact that the country club's in an enterprise fund, does that give the town or give us, as we think about a deficit in an enterprise fund versus a deficit in the overall town budget, does it give us any different flexibility in the, in the current paradigm or is a deficit just a deficit? Sue Nickerson, you may want to jump in here because my understanding is that the town is the backstop on this. The town is the backstop, and it, it one thing with an enterprise fund, if it is, if it ends up at a deficit at the end of the year, what we can do is we raise it on the next year's recap. And the recap, have you explained that, Sue? Uh, that's the tax recap, so it will it will add to everybody's taxes. But the goal or is to we, manage so that we don't reserve, reach that point. Yeah, or we do our reserve fund transfer from the town to the to the country club. So there's no magic in there. It's a deficit is a deficit. A deficit is a deficit. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Erin, I see your hand up. Yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, thanks to uh, Mary and Michelle for walking us through this. I wanted to go back to the tier one and tier two um, expender co expenditure controls. And I was just curious to understand um, a bit more about the cost reduction responsibility, the 60-40 split. Is that um, a, a rough proportional split? Is that the logic behind the 60-40? And if not, can you kind of explain a little bit more about that? So the um, Aaron, if, if you look at the five-year forecast, you have a town budget in FY21 of $29 million, and you have an education budget of $56.7 million. Okay. You then have a bunch of things that we call shared costs, things like OPEB, debt service, group insurance. You know, two things of note. First of all, those are shared costs. You know. Uh, I think 75% of the debt service is for school buildings. I think the group insurance is about 50-50. But more importantly, when you're thinking about cost reductions, you know, we can't say, well, you know, we're not going to pay our debt service or we're going to pay a lower amount. Uh, we certainly also don't want to forego our long-term liabilities, um, you know, and like not, not pay into OPEB. So as, as we looked at establishing a, you know, kind of a split, um, you know, using the 29 million and the 57 million, that was about a 34-66 split. Um, okay. And it, it just kind of seemed to us, let's just kind of do this 40-60 and that our, our colleagues on the school committee thought that that was reasonable as well. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. George, I see you're Got your hand up. Do yeah, thank you, Victor, and uh, and I will echo Aaron's thank you to Michelle and to Mary for all of this um, this background information. Um, so, I a couple of questions. I was on the call yesterday, uh, and Mary, I believe it is you that 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 brought up that several surrounding towns have have taken a different uh, approach to um, to reconciling projected budget deficits, and they have. Um, actually reduced uh, staff in some areas. 
Uh, so I'm wondering if any discussion of other options besides using a fund balance were considered, um, especially if we are really looking at a multi-year um, type of scenario. So that, that would be my first question, just whether those whether we had considered those things. Um, and, and having said that, I do appreciate, um, you know, within, within the financial plan that, that we looked to make, uh, to minimize disruption to, to our staffs. So um, yep. I guess I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth on this one. So um, uh, thank you, George. So there were kind of two things that we've heard. First of all, there are a number of communities that are furloughing people in FY20 to improve their FY20 situation. Uh, Brookline in two different waves has furloughed 200 people. Newton has furloughed 91. Hanover has furloughed 100 people. Randolph, Natick, and Rockland have also uh, either announced or have furloughed people. And, and again, that's for their situation in 20. As, as we looked at our situation in 20, um, as, as Michelle walked you through, we were in a slightly, in a slightly different place. Um, in looking at 21, uh, in speaking to some of my colleagues, you know, uh, around, uh, particularly in the South Shore, there are towns that for 21 are opening up their budgets right now and cutting. And I think, again, one of the things that, um, I think we are in somewhat of a unique situation in the strength of our fund balance. And, you know, for, for many years, we've been advocating for establishing this rainy day fund for having it, you know, in, in recent budget discussions, we talked about not using that excess fund balance to fund operating needs. We said, we have to save it for a rainy day. And I think from, from the board's perspective, we think that this is very much a rainy day and we've been saving f to use it for this purpose. So in some ways it, it didn't feel right to um, not, not apply any of the fund balance. It, it just sort of, it, it didn't seem consistent with what we've been saying. Um, I would also say that one of the other considerations and, and I, I see that Tom Mayo's joined, so he may want to chime in on this. One of the things that the town has to consider uh, when it comes to um, doing any sort of furloughs with our workforce is that uh, we are self-insured for unemployment. And so if you look at, if you look at, uh, if you furlough uh, people, we then have to pay the unemployment. And, you know, so so if you're looking at the financial impact of that, you know, if we want to save $100,000, um, we have to assume that we're going to pay, you know, 40 cents on the dollar in unemployment. Uh, so, you know, there were a lot of considerations given as to um, whether or not to keep our staffing in place uh, for the present time. Um, I, I think I may pause there. Hopefully Tom's had enough context to speak to George's question about, um, you know, wh why Hingham hasn't to date taken the action to furlough employees similar to um, what's occurred in some other communities, Tom. Sure. First of all, thank you, everyone. And it's nice to see you all. And sorry, I was late. I was over in the selectmen's meeting um, as Mary and Mar uh, Michelle were prior. Um, so, yes, yeah, so just real quick, it sounded, Mary, like you hit the high notes. The, uh, the fact is that while many communities could furlough and save 100% of those costs right off the bat, we cannot because we self-insure for unemployment. So you're looking at a 50-50 split there, uh, saving only 50% of, of that cost. So that's one point. The other is we did implement significant um, uh, spending controls early on, uh, both um, the, the municipal departments as well as the, um, the school department. So uh, we are anticipating some pretty hefty um, turnbacks as a result, uh, f uh, more than normal, as a matter of fact, and a shortfall of only, uh, right now anyway, projected shortfall of only $125,000. So um, we'll be able to safely cover that with the turnbacks from FY20. 
And I'll just add one final thing. We've also worked hard. We know that right now some things are easier to do from home than others. We worked hard to reassign staff to fill different gaps. So one example is your lovely Zoom host tonight, Heather, works in the clerk's office. Um, but we have folks from the library, the clerk's office, and our office serving as floating Zoom hosts for boards and committees that need it for these meetings. We have eight, eight or nine school nurses working with the health department team to trace COVID-19 cases and their close contacts to help out Susan Sarney and Kathy Crowley. We've got admin support from DPW and the conservation office also helping the health department team deal with all the calls and emails they're getting about masks and social distancing every day and all the changing guidance that's going out there. We're constantly pulling in different people from different departments to try to help support certainly the COVID-19 response. We also have folks from accounting, elder services, the library and the clerk making all these calls to seniors every week in town to, to check in and see, um, see what needs may or may not be are being met. So um, I think that's part of the, the reason um, we've also been able to, to continue operations this way. And everyone has really stepped up. It's really nice to be part of this team. When we ask for help, there's more than enough people who step up and say, I can do this. Um, Heather can send her weekend or weekday nights um, in meetings like this. So um, it's been very helpful. George, did you say you had another question? Uh, I do, uh, and, and thank you for that, uh, for Michelle, Tom, and, uh, and Mary. Um, that, that's very helpful, and, and, uh, and certainly I support everything that you all have said. Um, Victor, um, I may be getting ahead of ourselves here, but I'm just wondering, uh, our financial policy does not allow us to use fund balance for operating expenses, um, and certainly this is this is more than a rainy day it's a it's a deluge but um how what are the mechanics of how we're going to get around um, that policy issue and and if you want to deal with it later that's fine also yeah i, I think we can talk about it further uh, later um but i mean a couple of quick points um it is a policy right um as opposed to a hard and fast regulation uh it also allows payment of capital and it allows payment of um a sort of long-term benefit type thing, like OPEB type items. So we can talk further about it, but those are, you know, a couple of items that sort of jump to mind. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Andy. <clears throat> I have uh, two questions for Michelle. And um, the first is uh, on, directing your attention to page four of your memorandum regarding the fiscal 21 revenue forecasting. Uh, the, the state aid forecast as of May 9th is 8 million 165 to 18. In the uh, spreadsheet, which is a, the, the forecast is for all the other numbers seems to be the same except for the state aid there it's nine million seven ninety nine what what am i missing i believe the difference the, is the msba the, funding, yeah. Where the in the MSBA. Memo, yeah in the memo we pulled it out of the state aid number and put it down below to that other revenue line with the asterisk i'm sorry what did you pull out the msba um, assistance that helps us pay the debt for the high school project Okay, it, and if, so if that went back in, those numbers would reconcile. Yes. The other question I had is on the uh, template that uh, we just we just got um, the uh, municipal apartment shows uh, DPW assistant director plan to hire at start of uh, the third quarter, so that. I just want to make sure I understand how to read this. So the, it was budgeted for 93,000 as a full year, but it, this will show savings of uh, a quarter of that in Q1 and Q2, correct? So I, I put that in as a placeholder, you're correct. Um, I don't know if we'll definitely hire that person in Q3, but if that's just an example of um, if we didn't hire them for the first two quarters, those are the savings we would realize you know, from not bringing that person on at that time. And then the if you go down. 
Go ahead. It's a demonstration of how the of how that spreadsheet will work. Okay, and and likewise, I guess going down to the capital items on the in, uh, IT assets, that that I assume is a similar. Uh, yes, that's okay. also a placeholder just to show. Um, I put some amounts in for the first three or maybe all of the quarters just to show how the spreadsheet works. Right now, all of those projects are are defaulted to be um, deferred for the whole year, but once um, we in the school populate those um, columns, you'll be able to see the real picture. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, appreciate the... Ed. Yeah, my question is for Mary, and it, it has to do with the um, point that George raised originally, and that is the um, unique approach that we're taking relative to other towns. Uh, we are, it, it seems essentially, um, asking the town to approve our original spending budget. And then at the same time, and I've heard you talk about this, Mary, asking them to trust us uh, to manage our spending in such a way that um, we do not deficit spend. Uh, now, the trust side of that um, is probably the most important part of that. And I'm, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about not only getting through town meeting, but how do we make sure that the town continues to trust us <laughs> all the way through fiscal 21? Sure. Um, you yeah. know, thank you, Ed. Um, thank you for the question. And, um, you know, I, I will just say that, that personally, this is, um, that's, that's been something that, you know, Tom and Michelle and Sue will tell you, we, we talked about a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, with, with all the uncertainty right now, we may not have to reduce spending. And if we opened up the budgets right now and, you know, how would we know how much spending to cut? Well, you know, let's say we cut, you know, a couple million dollars. If the revenue picture isn't as bad as what we think, we have no ability during the year to sort of restore those things. Mm -hmm. um, things, that, things that have really been vetted. And, you know, what, what I think we're essentially asking town meeting is if if you would allow if you would fully fund our budgets we would commit to you that we would manage our spending and that if things get worse we are prepared to reduce our budgets um for me the the document that's been put together and the reason that the board of selectmen the school committee and and in fact we're asking all of you to to join us in voting to support um, is, is our way of memorializing that commitment both to one another and, and most importantly to the town. Um, I think from the perspective of the Board of Selectmen and the school committee, I think we understand the significant situation that we're in. And, you know, I, I know we've talked with, with Tom, Michelle, and Sue, and, and I know the school committee's talked about you know, how will we manage that? I think starting in tier one with only going ahead with essential, essential hiring and essential capital, um, I think gives us a better ability to make reductions if we have to. Um, for a, for a, a person like me who is really driven by the numbers, um, this is a little bit of a unique approach, but I would hate to look back a year from now and say, um, you know, we we overreacted or we underreacted. And and I think this this plan allows us a little bit of flexibility that um, that feels important. You know, with with respect to the question of of town meeting and trusting the town, um, I think that that our town over the years, past boards of selectmen, past advisory committees, past school committees, I think we've demonstrated fiscal responsibility to the town in many ways. Um, our school department hasn't had a reserve fund transfer in like 30 years. Um, our last two school building projects came in under budget. Um, on the municipal side, you know, we, we manage to our budgets. I think we have good processes for 
for everything we do. And so my, my hope is that the financial stewardship that we've demonstrated over the years um, will give town meetings some confidence that if necessary, uh, we will reduce our spending and, you know, just because it's authorized doesn't mean we're going to spend it. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. And I just have one parting comment is, as I um, listened to the various meetings where the financial management plan was discussed, it became very apparent that it has a lot of moving parts. And uh, when I read the actual document that was recently circulated, I think um, whoever uh, had a hand in putting it together did a wonderful job. Even I understood it. I think it covered everything very well. So well done. Thank you, Ed. Um, Evan. Um, I just want, I want to echo, um, I think, what Ed just said there. And I do think, you know, Ed, the trust has come from, if you look at where we are from a reserve fund uh, a, a balance that we can lever for this, it, it speaks to the management that we've done since 08, 09, when things weren't quite uh, in the situation we are now. And I think it's more of a request and a comment. Um, you know, I think we're way past a V-shaped recovery here. So this will probably span into fiscal year 21 and 22, just, you know, the overall economy. And it, we've talked about this, we've touched on it a few different times in different discussions, but the way we do things in the future may look slightly different than the way we've done things in the past. And I do think I'd love to see um, you know, Tom, I know you and Dr. Austin have worked closely together on a number of budgetary items. I'd love to see us put a little bit more of a structural plan in place on how we, Mary touched on shared services or shared expenses across departments, how we look at um, really levering more shared um, resources and services across town, uh, the municipal and the school side, because there are some natural redundancies, and I, I don't have a laundry list of them right here, but I do think that it, it could afford us an opportunity to look at doing things slightly different in the future that could free up um, in a world where we may not be able to get the, the resources we'd like in fiscal year 21 and 22. We may be able to, with the existing headcount we have, uh, create new positions and new roles for people where we're kind of the shift of work and the way we work changes a bit. So I'd like, I'd love to see a little bit of that. And I think what you guys have done um, is very thoughtful and I do love the kind of overall approach. And I realize everyone was reacting to the situation, but if we have some time over the next year and we kind of get this through town meeting, which I don't see why it wouldn't, it's a very, it's a solid plan that we really take a hard look at how we kind of allocate more resources across the entire uh, town budget as opposed to just municipal and schools. Victor, do you mind if I respond? Go ahead, Tim. Uh, Evan, thank you very much for the comment. Um, I just want to, if, if it helps underscore the degree to which that's a priority of mine, uh, and I know it's a priority of Dr. Austin's, um, as we put together our reopening plan, uh, the state and the, all the municipalities across the state are doing this now. Um, we are all working together to try to open in a, in, a, in a logical and safe manner. And just today, I got an invitation from the superintendent to participate in his school reopening program, his, uh, his team uh, that's going to manage the, how the schools reopen. Um, that's, that is unique. I can tell you, I can assure you that that's not happening, happening elsewhere in the state where the sitting superintendent reached out to the town manager and asked them to be a part of how they reopen schools in the fall. And um, I was just thrilled. Um, obviously, Michelle and I are excited to uh, participate and find ways to share um, both uh, perhaps, you know, reimbursable expenses, programs, ideas, concepts, uh, not just expenses, but, um, but ways to make the town as efficient as possible at every turn. It is absolutely a priority of mine. If I haven't made that clear to you all in the couple of years I've been here, I assure you it is a priority of mine. So thank you for the comments, Evan. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Dave? Um, yeah, just a, a quick question around the um, COVID-related expense reimbursement. Uh, just a Procedural question, are, is it pretty bright line what's reimbursable and what's not? 
because I note I note that we're taking we're not including those expenses in our in our kind of deficit calculations, which, which makes total sense if we're confident that you know it's not a gray area and someone down the line is going to you know pull the rug out from underneath us fifty thousand or hundred thousand dollars later. You, you want me to take that? Anybody? Sure. So. Um... The, the reimbursement procedures have not been defined yet. <laughs> Isn't that helpful? Um, so while we can't tell you what they'll look like in the future, we do obviously know we're going to have significant reimbursements. You know, one giant question that I have is, <laughs> I wonder if they'll consider reimbursing, ultimately, probably not in the first phase, but reimbursing uh, lost revenue. <laughs> that would be a really great start, never mind just uh, straight expenses. So I think that we're... Um, where we have a fair understanding of what type of uh, obvious expenses that they will reimburse, masks, gloves, um, departmental overtime as a specific uh, uh, result of COVID, things like that. It, it, there are other potential costs that might require <laughs> a little bit of um, imagination to, to explain how they're COVID related. And it's those that I think um, we need to have a better understanding of. So. We're, we're waiting for that guidance to come now in our, in our consideration or for our purposes, they'll come from Plymouth County uh, and they'll be issued here. I, I expected them. I was hoping for them Friday, really hoping for them yesterday, expected them today. <laughs> so uh, as soon as we get them, we'll, we'll have a better understanding of what types of reimbursements we're really going to see. Thanks. Tom. Uh, Aaron, you have another question or is that just, just your hand's still up from last time. I uh, must still be up. I can see if I can turn that off. Lower hand. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I don't see anyone else at the moment. Um, so, Michelle or, or Tom, can you walk us through your view in the plan on the specific role for ADCOM. What, what is ADCOM actually doing under this plan? Michelle, do you want to take that? <laughs> I was going to ask you the same thing. Um, I touched my nose first. <laughs> <laughs> we knew he was going to ask you, Michelle. <laughs> so the, excuse me, the question, I'm sorry, this is Andy. Uh, the question is, what is ADCOM expected to do? Victor? Yes, so, so what is, so this plan has a role for ADCOM that's sort of in a number of you know places here, and I'm asking to explain exactly what what they envision Adcom would be doing. Thank you. I think we view Adcom as the overall provider of oversight of this plan. Um, Adcom would be represented in the monthly meetings through the forecast group, through the chair and the vice chair, but then the quarterly reporting will also come to Adcom. And I think you see in here that some of the um, sort of the final say or the decision-making authority rests with ADCOM in terms of helping us trigger a move between tiers. Um, so we're, we're looking for that overall monitoring and oversight um, role to be played by the advisory committee. As we do these projections every month, um, as you do with the budget process, right? It's sort of the, the giggle testing and making sure that all of our assumptions and our projections and the information we're using make sense and that we're all confident um, in what we're project projecting and the directions that we're moving in. So you're envisioning the forecast group would meet what monthly or more frequently or? The forecast group would meet monthly to review and put together these projections. And then it's, we wrote in here that it's expected that the members of the forecast group will keep their respective boards informed we felt like it, it might be a little bit too much to have um, a formal meeting every single month with the selectmen, the school committee, and the advisory committee, and that that could be accomplished through the forecast group. But that quarterly, um, there are more formal presentations and reports made to those three boards. And at what point does ADCOM step in and say, hey, wait a minute, these numbers are showing we're, we're in trouble or, or the other side saying, hey, the numbers are pretty good so we can ease up? I think that's an update that the, the ADCOM representatives on the forecast group would be providing back to this committee monthly. But like we talked about before, I think quarterly is really where we're going to 
be able to see, get a, best, a better sense of the revenue coming in, um, particularly because some revenues come in quarterly. So after September 30th and after January, uh, December 31st, I think those will be two big points that will help us um, inform where we are for FY21. And just a couple of additional points, if you don't mind, just to jump in. Um, thank you, Michelle. That was very thorough. The um, the other pieces would be the tier one plans. We'll be presenting the tier one plans to the uh, to Adcom to review. And like Michelle says, giggle test. Uh, make sure that those are uh, seem appropriate based on the types of um, projected uh, revenue shortfalls we're expecting. And the other place is we were all talking about you know the dire the dire um, the dire likelihood that we're going to be working under but it there's also a possibility that we're um that things bounce back and if that happens uh we would ex we would um expect that adcom would be able to make a decision to come out of the austerity measures if appropriate um we we wanted to put that in in adcom's hands as well now i don't expect that would happen at the absolute earliest would be after q2 um but you know who, who knows we're gonna stay optimistic until there's <laughs> reason not to. <laughs> and the tier one plans that Adcom would be reviewing, um, are those updated periodically or is it one time only plan? Those will need to be updated. So we'll be presenting um, soon before either this week or before town meeting, um, the, tier, the current tier one plans to start the fiscal year in. But then depending on the situation um, going into Q2, whether we find ourselves in tier one or tier two, we're gonna need to keep updating those plans likely quarterly and present them to you to make sure that um, we are in fact coming up with the 40% and the 60% of the projected deficit and show you how we plan to get there. Okay. Ed? Yeah, I have kind of a, a wonky uh, governance question here, and it, it pertains and it, it pertains to language on page six of the financial management plan, having to do with the advisory committee in consultation with the forecast group and the board of selectmen shall institute tier two action plan requirements, um, as as well as moving to other into and out of other tiers. That seems to go beyond our advisory capacity uh, into one of um, independent, by independent, I mean that we uh, don't need the vote of any other body in order to make that decision. Um, can you explain that a little bit for me? That seems to be a unique role for the uh, advisory committee. I don't know who that goes to. <laughs> Mary or Tom want to help me out with this one? Yeah, no, yeah. Who wants to? Mary, do you want to take a stab, or do you want me to do it? Uh, I'm not sure, Ed. I, I completely understand the question. I'm, I'm just looking at the language. Could you just repeat the question? Yeah, the um, and I'm I'm referring specifically to language uh, in the third last paragraph of page six. Yep. The advisory committee, and I'll skip the intervening words there shall institute tier two action plan requirements. And in other places, it also gives us shall authority mm -hmm. uh, to move in and out of various tiers. Um, my understanding has always been the advisory committee is advisory and that we advise um, votes at town hall and so forth. I've, I've never experienced us having actual independent decision-making authority. Now, am I wrong just in terms of the extent of the kind of things that yeah. the advisory committee has the ability to do? Yeah, um, th thank, you for, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Um, you know, as I think as we looked at this, we thought about a couple of things. First of all, the advisory committee is the finance committee for the town. And given the very unique and, and unusual and complex financial situation we find ourselves <coughs> in, it it feels appropriate to us that the advisory committee um, would 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 play a very strong role in in this plan. Um, and I think the second thing I would just note is that is that where you see these pieces, it would be um, 
you know, in, in particular with, uh, with tier two, it's in consultation with the forecast group and the board of selectmen. So I, I think what we're kind of looking at here is again, given the unusual circumstances, we need to be making decisions together and seeking input really from everybody, most particularly our finance committee. And I'll just, I'll just add to that. The, um, that's one of the reasons I think, Ed, why we're looking for buy-in from all three committees um, so that we all acknowledge our roles uh, in this process. This is um, a little bit outside of what we would normally do for sure. Yeah, no, I, I understand the, uh, the consultation aspect of it. I wouldn't expect the advisory committee to do anything independently of that. Uh, but I, I think you clarified it for me when you said we would be acting as the finance committee for the town. It would be in that capacity that we would That's have correct. the governance authority. Okay, good. Thanks. That helps. Dave? Uh, just question, picking up on Ed's comment there, would that, I, I guess that's presumed to be a majority of ADCOM would make that recommendation? Or, or I mean, that would be a majority vote? I, majority? Yes, it, I guess it would be, although we could discuss that, but it, it would be a yeah, I don't see anything, nothing's jumping to mind in any of our rules or in the bylaws that would say we had to have a supermajority vote. Right. No, I was just asking if that was a default mechanism. I mean, I'm, I don't have a strong feeling one way or another. Um, I, I mean, I could envision a scenario where, a, you know, a nine to six vote or eight to seven vote or something would feel uncomfortable at some level if there was that much um you know just as any recommendation in the, in the warrant uh, now whether you would require a different threshold is a whole other question but I, I guess i just threw it out there for consideration victor if, if i could just um uh, respond to that one 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 of the things and and tom really drove this as we were looking at at this plan is to make sure that we had some specific metrics so that the question of for example you know, going into tier two was really data driven and that and that an important role of the advisory committee is also kind of, you know, implementing what's in place. So, you know, our, our view would be that if if we have a projected deficit that exceeds a half million dollars, we would expect to go into tier two. And, and our hope would be that, you know, for our advisory colleagues, that that threshold is, um, it, you know, gives us all gives us all a data point by which to make that determination. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would say that if, you know, if things are jumping around a little and we have a deficit that, you know, uh, to me, once we go over 500, unless they're really unusual circumstances, we're in tier two. Um, and, and again, that was the intent of, the, of some of those parameters. Mm -hmm. Now, Mary, as I understand it, that the the deficit, the, the five hundred thousand, is looking at sort of the projected amount over the course of the year. So that if if revenues normally lag exp, uh, expenses in a particular month, we would take that into account. And that, in fact, I think the um, the tracking chart is set up to accommodate that, is if I read it correctly. Is that right? Yes. It would also take into account the impact of, of things like, you know, not filling positions and the cost containment measures that Dr. Austin and Tom have put in place. So hypothetically, at the end of the first quarter, you know, you could have a circumstance where the revenues, you know, the revenue projection is, is to be, um, you know, another half a million dollars in the hole. But by that time, we also could have saved that in operating expense savings. So that, that was the intent as well as looking at the bottom line because we expect that um, in particular in the first quarter that, um, that, that we should be able to, to drop some savings to the bottom line. Okay. George. Uh, okay, just, uh, just so that I'm, I'm, I'm clear in, um, Let's say we go through the year and things look reasonably well, but we're going to be about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars short. So we don't trigger tier two. Would 
my my assumption would be that we would tap fund balance for for that sort of a deficit. Would that be correct? No. So the even though five hundred thousand dollars is the is the threshold between tier one and tier two, if there was a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar deficit within tier one, we still have to commit to reducing that deficit with the 40-60 split with these um, expenditure controls or other measures. And so it's not that we get a pass if the deficit is under 500,000, it's just that we stay within tier one measures to try to address it. Okay. Victor, I had a question. I don't know, I don't, I don't know what to hit to raise my hand, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to follow up on Dave's question, uh, and I guess Ed's, I agree, the plan seems to me to be very well thought out and reasonable, and it seems that we are in a position to be able to handle this better, and I'm, I'm glad that we're not furloughing employees because people are struggling enough without losing their income as well, so I, I think that's a, a really good thing. Um, but to the point of, it has always seemed to me that part of what the advisory committee does is between town meetings, we stand for the, to represent the town in some way. I mean, that seems like that's part of our role. And so it makes sense to me that we would have, just like it's our budget recommendation ultimately that goes to town meeting. So that the shall language I, I'm fine with. And, it, and to go to Dave's question, if we reached a point where the advisory committee was so divided over what to do, that we were talking about very close votes, that might be when it's time to actually call a special town meeting. I mean, it may be that if there's such a dispute at that time, that there's other procedures to, to go to at that point. So all of that leaves me comfortable. And I, I just wanted to make that comment. And I thank uh, everybody for their work, because I agree, I, I found this document to be very readable and understandable. And I think the town meeting participants will likewise find it that way. So that's all. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, Libby. Uh, just, I guess, one point that I was trying to think through, and I want to make sure with, um, I guess, Michelle or whoever, that, that this thinking is correct. So um, if we're looking at it that the town is willing, um, given that we wouldn't, we would keep the existing um, expense, um, expenses and projections as they are, but the town would be willing to provide as much of a, as a $3.3 million backstop. And the big but is that, but we would never get to that point without at the $3 million level, we'd be pretty deep into tier two. So, I mean, there would need to be significant austerity measures already taken into place before we'd ever hit that point. And in a sense, is my understanding correct where that's just really a, you know, um, an absolute sort of worst case scenario, but we, we'd never, they're almost, um, they're kind of mutually exclusive because you, we could never hit that $3 million uh, hold backfill if, if we weren't reducing expenses. Is my thinking correct? No. Does that make sense? Victor, do you mind if I? <laughs> or um, so the if there was a three if a three million dollar threshold um deficit appeared that would mean that's on top of already using the 3.3 million from fund balance so no i'm talking about the 3.3 that we were talking about for fund balance well i guess right, so i gotcha i'm i'm yeah I, i'm with you we're already these, doing that to meet that level these you're right these thresholds are all are the five hundred thousand dollar threshold is on top of that. So, okay, if the revenue picture looks way worse than we've already projected, um, we're basically okay. assuming in this plan that we'll we will be using the three point three million from fund balance. Plus, um, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yep, that's the yep. So the three the three point three million is just to to keep our head our kind of our head above water. But if we start to get underwater, then that's where it we start to go to tier one and tier two. Gotcha. That's right. Thank and then you. One, Sorry, I just misunderstood a little bit. And there's been some concern, right? If we, what if we start the year and we're not so conservative and we just start hiring people and spending willy nilly? All that does is accelerate a move to tier two. So it's right. against everyone's interest in doing right. that. Right. 
Thanks. Okay. Other comments, questions? People have um, thoughts on this plan versus some other way to balance the budget. Or we can, um, yeah. now that you've heard this presentation. Not my 12 page plan that I'll just send along to everybody. I mean, Sorry, we haven't had this that long, Victor, so I think it'll give us, you know, it'll be nice to have a little bit of time to kind of, now that we've had a discussion about it, think about it. Okay, so why don't we do this? Um, you know, think what we've heard tonight, review the plan more closely. On Thursday, we will have a discussion as to whether this um, plan is the way we want to go, whether there's some other approach we want to take, or this, whether we have modifications to this plan. Um, you'll note that staff, when they prepared this, did put proposed votes. So, yes, we would be asked, this is on page eight, the proposed vote three. So, they're asking us to vote to approve and adhere to the plan uh, and to authorize the chair of the committee to, to execute the plan on behalf of the committee. Um, so, that is one approach. Um, and then we've sort of touched on a few other options and maybe folks have other suggestions too so we can have a further discussion on that on thursday so um let me open it to ask if anyone in the public has any questions or comments on on this uh on the plan and seeing none Let's move on to our next budget um, agenda item, which is uh, liaison reports. Uh, Dave, I think you have something on the water update. Uh, yeah, I'll just go quickly on that. Just to, I've honestly forgotten where we left off in the water um, development. So I'll just go quickly. It has been named. It's now called the Weir, Weir River Water System. Um, I think the most important uh, news is that the uh, RFP for the water operator was put out. They received three bids. Uh, they were thoroughly vetted and compared on a comparable uh, basis. And coincidentally, the highest rated for technical merit and the most economical bid uh, was the same bid from Suez. And so Suez has been selected, the decision to choose them by the Water Transition Evaluation Committee at least in the transition committee was unanimous uh, and in the meeting that they had uh, on April 27th there was a, uh, a, a unanimous view that it was a, a it was a great process kudos to Michelle and Tom and everybody for the process that that was conducted and uh, B I think everybody on the transition committee was thrilled with the um, with the proposals and the, and with the selection so that is good news. The uh, water superintendent search is still outstanding, and obviously with the COVID issues, COVID issues, it's been um, it's, it has not moved at the same pace that was anticipated. And it's my understanding from the water transition committee feedback that uh, Suez, the new contractor, had also suggested perhaps waiting a little bit um, until the timing on the closing and the town's operation was more certain. Uh, which is the segue into say that, um, that I, I think it's fair to say, and certainly Tom or Mary could correct me if they feel otherwise, but that the uh, kind of early to mid -Ju July time frame is is the working assumption at the moment as to when this deal gets wrapped up. Um, the uh, I've been a party thanks to to Mary's inviting me to conversations about some of the longer or some of the financing options before the town in terms of how to finance the purchase price of the of the water company. Um, so they're given the interest rate environment, you know, eight weeks ago, uh, it was different than it is today. But in between there, it got really bad for a while. And it seems to be calming down again, which is good. So, um, you know, the town is doing a very thorough analysis on what the best uh, financing options are uh, given the financial models that the that the town meeting has approved. So that process is ongoing, but a lot of work, and I, I see a lot of faces on this Zoom call that are also on those calls. So I know that people are are moving in many, many different directions at once. But, um, uh, oh, and then I think finally, uh, I would point out that the 
one of the kind of key gating items is for a business plan to be submitted to the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, that I believe has been submitted uh, and is uh, an important piece of the puzzle and certainly a, a, a critical piece to us ultimately getting a, the, the license of the town getting the license once the acquisition has taken place. So um, I can take any questions, but I think I hit the highlights and Mary or Tom, if you guys have anything else you want to add, feel free. Point out that your, your time frame was accurate. All right. Thank you, Dave. Any questions for Dave from the committee? Okay. Um, schools. Um, George, were you going to update us? Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick things um, to update the group on from the school committee side. Um, first of all, as, I, as you all have heard tonight, uh, the schools have signed on to this financial plan uh, that we've been discussing this evening. Uh, and secondly, um, the schools um, have, uh, the school committee has, uh, has created a new subcommittee, a financial um, policy subcommittee, and, um, and have staffed it with three members, and, uh, and they will be working uh, very closely um, with John Ferris um, on um, all aspects of the school budget. So um, good news going forward. Great. Thank you. Great. Tom, is that you indicating you have a question or am I misreading that? Tom, uh, I, I, Tom Bell, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's no. Tom Bell. Okay. Yeah. No. All right. No and then master, master plan committee, uh, Andy or Kathleen? Yeah, uh, this is Andy. You can hear me okay? Yes. Uh, the March meetings of the committee uh, were, were canceled, but uh, the committee got together by Zoom on April 22nd, and uh, then that was essentially to get together, test technology, and plan future meetings, and to encourage all of the members to get their comments in on the drafts that had been circulated about the subjects of visions and goals, public facilities, etc. And now the committee has scheduled meetings to discuss those uh, drafts uh, and hopefully finalize them. The meetings are scheduled for tomorrow night, the 13th, uh, the 20th, and the 27th. And I believe the goal is still to have a draft document uh, prepared uh, in relatively final form for it. Well, a draft of circulation, I think, outside the committee by the 27th. Uh, Bill Ramsey was on earlier. I see he, uh, I don't think he's on any longer, but I was going to ask him if, if that's still the plan, but I believe it is. So, uh, but if you want to further update, uh, tune in tomorrow night to the Zoom meeting of the uh, Master Plan Committee. So they're, they're attempting to get back on track. Okay, thank you. Questions for Randy? Okay. I have one. Um, yes, go ahead, Julie. Right. <laughs> Andy, um, when you're talking about putting together a draft, is it the draft of, weren't at some point they were going to make different categories for more breakout sessions and research across a number of categories? Or is that they, already completed? I'm sorry. The, the 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 committee has put together drafts of each section or each category, circulated those among themselves, uh, and and uh, I believe now have received back or will by tomorrow night receive back the committee's own comments. Then their plan is to work with their consultants to finalize, if you will that into something to be more broadly circulated. Um, and I'm not sure how precisely how they're going to be soliciting public comments, but that that is a, a, a draft by the committee, not the final report of the committee. Okay, thank you. Kathleen, do you have anything to add to that? Well, their original plan was to, to focus one meeting on each individual section of that plan. Um, I think um, 
I'm not sure if they're still planning to do that based on the COVID situation and so on, but that, that was the plan. They were going to focus on each, a meeting on each one, but anyway, they're going forward. I mean, I think they're still on schedule for, for getting this done uh, prior, to, um, prior to the fall. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item, just a quick update on town meeting. It's still scheduled for the, I guess it was the 22nd, that, that Monday, um, the end of uh, next last Monday of June. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion among, um, well, I guess Tom's been involved, uh, Michael Puzo, Karen Johnson, uh, and I, I guess some others, well, I, uh, Eileen McCracken, uh, on how to do it safely if indeed we're allowed to go ahead uh, at that point with a large gathering, how to do social distancing at the high school using all the usual rooms, the, the gym, the um, uh, auditorium, the cafeteria, and then uh, as necessary spill out into as many classrooms as, as necessary. Uh, there's a lot of logistics that are being discussed as to you know, how to um, actually within those rooms spread out, how to set the rooms up, how to deal with um, disinfecting microphones, et cetera, how to get people comfortable with all those sorts of things. So all this is being discussed. Um, there's been some talk, I think, of perhaps using the middle school as well. If um, you, know, you might recall last year where we had the large turnout for water, there was a, the middle school was gonna be a, a, a fallback um, uh, location and was able to connect um, to, the, um, to the high school. Um, you know, th those, these things are being discussed, no final decisions. I think another thing of concern is, is there a way to have folks at Linden Ponds or similar facilities um, participate from those locations with assistant moderators? Um, there has been some discussion of, is there a way to, um, upfront do education of uh, through perhaps videos on town website, that sort of thing. Uh, educate people in advance of the warrant beyond just what our you know, warrant, uh, uh, the warrant discussion and comments are. So all that is in the mix. Um, if we are unable to have town meeting before the end of June, then there is legislation that was passed this this spring in um, in anticipation of the pro this problem, which allows towns to go ahead with their budgeting, their spending based on last year's budget. Um, that, of course, would impose immediate restrictions. Um, there is also legislation which has not been passed yet, but is kicking around the state senate that would allow open meeting towns to proceed with a reduced quorum, perhaps as low as one tenth of the quorum, um, still doesn't, but you could only address the budget. You couldn't address other, other items, whether they're money items or otherwise. Um, so Tom, I don't know if you, um, you've been certainly more involved in this um, than I, I just see this from a periphery. Um, do you have anything further to add on that? Just that we are working closely with um, both Joe Moschino and, uh, and Pat O'Connor. Uh, they have some insight from the state house and what's happening there and the governor's guidance. You know, one of the big questions is whether we can or not, but it, it's really this uh, 10 person, you know, no more than 10 people uh, gathering in a location. How is that being defined? Is that being ex uh, extended to town meetings and municipalities? I know most communities around us have extended their town meetings to the uh, end of June, uh, like us trying to get it in before the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, I think Victor, you commented that there is a plan in place that we could adopt in order to move on um, into the fiscal year without having adopted the new budget. Obviously that's not the preferred approach. Um, so th there's, you're absolutely right, Victor. There's a lot of discussions, a lot of planning um, that is taking place, that is yet to take place and, uh, and we're, we're on it. Questions? Okay. Um, 
I, I would also just like to point out, Victor, that someone told me after last year's town meeting that I'll never have another town meeting like that again. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I no longer believe in any of you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this isn't like last year. This is quite different. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a really good point, Victor. That's a good point. <laughs> All right, housekeeping items. Uh, just uh, again to reiterate, we're meeting uh, in seven o'clock on Thursday uh, with the principal item to discuss uh, how we want to deal with the, uh, the budget deficit, uh, this plan or otherwise. And then our... Um, I, I think it's no surprise that our early June end of the year party is not going to happen. I don't think we're going to be socially distancing um, at that point. So um, those are the only housekeeping items I had. I don't know, anyone else have something? Well, Victor, I just want to note, in case Julie missed it for the minutes, that we were visited by Sue's dog, who was gorgeous. Oh. So, so if anyone missed that. <laughs> In attendance. Shoot. Yes, yes he's, I miss that. That, that. That's the one bad thing about being home because now he wants to be walked all the time. <laughs> well, he wanted some camera time, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A little levity on such a serious. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we need a uh, motion to adjourn and we also need to do it by roll call, so. Um, I move to adjourn. Second. Bob Curley. Aye. Julie Straley. Aye. Tom Bellier. Yes. Aaron <laughs> Kelly. Aye. Eric Haskell. Aye. George Dennis. Aye. Libby Claypool. Aye. Evan Sheehan. Evan, leave us. Andy McElhaney. Sorry, I muted. I. Sorry. <laughs> Andy McElhaney. Aye. Davaline Cooper. Aye. Dave Anderson. Aye. Nancy McDonald. Aye. Ed Gatos. Aye. Kathleen Amon. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, Thanks. Heather. You're welcome. Yeah, well, I'll see. I'll see you Thursday too. I'll be back Thursday for this. Lucky you. <laughs> Bye, -bye. Bye, everyone. Good job, everybody. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.